It's a pleasure to be here. This is my first uh, DNA Nexus Connect event. Um, I started at DNA Nexus about six months ago. <clears throat> what they won't tell you is that I was actually hired to be the director of product marketing. And within a week, uh, I was squirreled away to head this new initiative, um, partly because I, I was coming from UCSF, where I was uh, heading up the molecular oncology initiative. Um, and also have a deep uh, experience in data curation. And um, uh, as I was talking with somebody at, at lunch, um, uh, an abnormal pleasure in um, writing a lot of documentation around how to curate data so that it's consistent, semantically um, consistent, et cetera. Anyways, so, um, uh, but when I was considering um, jumping back into industry and joining DNA Nexus, one of the things that was so appealing about DNA Nexus as a company was how customer focused it truly is. And um, after being here for six months, um, it's really great to see that absolutely be the case. This is a fantastic team to work with, scientists, engineers, um, the creative people in the marketing group that uh, helped put on this fantastic event. So I'm very happy that I, I made the jump back into industry. Um, and the project that I'm going to talk about today was really uh, absolutely born out of that DNA Nexus drive to solve uh, customer problems and to understand what the challenges are for our customers and to um, uh, um, bring solutions to those problems. Um, and so that's what I'm going to talk about today, uh, just to keep with the theme of uh, data sets and the need for data uh, in the space. And this is a new solution for DNA Nexus, the clinical genomics um, data solution. And so the challenges that we were hearing from our customers, a lot of which we've talked about today, um, particularly in pharma, R&D groups, uh, therapeutic area um, heads, um, therapeutic area teams, we're looking to access real-world clinical data um, to gain insights into disease heterogeneity, into um, um, outcomes, patient outcomes, therapeutic response outcomes, and then pair that data with uh, genetic data, genomic data, to hopefully identify drivers of disease and drug response. Again, all of this working towards this vision of precision medicine, of transforming the treatment and disease and treatment of disease and improve patient outcomes through better qualified targets um, and um, biomarkers that would um, uh, help uh, mark and predict uh, treatment response. So those are the challenges. Those are big challenges on their own. Um, they're even more difficult when the disease-specific data sets that are needed in order to um, derive those insights are either uh, don't exist for a specific disease area or they fall short in uh, genomic detail or clinical detail or uh, completeness or quality um, or perhaps they exist and they're not accessible to commercial entities. And so that was the challenge um, that, you know, long before I started, the company was uh, in the works. We were trying to figure out how to solve this problem um, for our customers. Simultaneously, we work really closely with our healthcare provider institutions um, who are also very driven to answer some of these same questions and they have their own precision medicine initiatives that they want to move forward um, and are looking to add uh, much deeper sequencing information on their patients. And so we realized that we were in a unique position to bring all of this together through partnering with our healthcare um, provider um, partners and customers um, to bring about a solution to these challenges. And that solution um, simply is to provide access to very deeply annotated, high quality, complete, disease specific clinical genomic data sets for biomedical research and development. And importantly, um, the uh, disease, these data sets um, would meet the needs not just of, say, pharma R&D groups, but also of the healthcare providers that, again, are looking to leverage even deeper, they already have all the information about the patients, but add on that genomic um, detail as well so that they could start to uh, gain insights and, and improve treatment. And so um, there's a, a lot of folks that are doing this, so what is it that's unique about our approach? Um, and again, I will bring back the DNA Nexus customer focus and the fact that we are being very intentional and very focused on making sure that the uh, clinical data extraction process that we develop and the sequencing protocols that we build for these disease-specific cohorts 
um, again, are very intentional about addressing unmet need. And what I mean by that is that we are, um, uh, on the clinical data side, capturing disease staging in great detail, treatment regimens being very complete on start-stop dates, et cetera, um, and longitudinally tracking those treatment courses and patient outcomes. Um, that the clinical data process, extraction process that we um, design and implement um, will involve uh, some manual curation, um, that this process will be auditable, and again, that this will be longitudinally following patients um, over a minimum of three years for the, the disease cohorts that I'll talk about today, along with automated extraction of data from the electronic health record. On the genomic side, um, the key is um, um, making sure that the assays that we um, um, source out to sequence service providers um, meet the questions that, uh, again, um, both pharma R&D and healthcare institutions have about these patient populations. Uh, so whether that's for the colorectal cancer uh, cohort that I'll talk about shortly, uh, whole exome sequencing on tumor and blood, uh, microbiome sequencing on stool sample plus tumor RNA-seq, so getting very deep annotation on the genomic side on these patients. Uh, the key differentiator is, um, or one of the key different differentiators is that, um, again, being very mindful about patient consent, we want to include the right of recontact for additional da data, and this will help us address what we call unanticipated need. So when we start talking to pharma companies about these data sets and we share the protocols that we're designing for the clinical data extraction and the genomic assays we're going to do, inevitably the answer is, this looks fantastic uh, for the questions that I have now, but I'm going to be doing discovery on these data sets and I, we guarantee that we're going to need to go back, ask some more questions, or get additional um, data. And so the consent that we are implementing in all of these cases will include the right to recontact should we need to extend questionnaires or go in and, and do additional assays. So that's um, kind of the, the differentiator on how we're approaching the extraction of clinical data and the genomic data. The other key to this being successful is building a very strong network of healthcare partners. Um, and we, um, I'm going to talk about um, one of the cohorts that um, we're getting very close to operational on for multiple sclerosis that we're doing in partnership with Sutter Health. And, uh, Greg Trinaw is going to uh, talk after me to explain a little bit more about um, how that's all going to work. Um, but um, in building a network of partnerships um, in healthcare providers, it's going to give us access to over 25 million patients, both in the U.S. and internationally. And that really is going to be key in giving us, as we scale these data sets and scale these cohorts, um, diversity in disease areas, so we won't um, just be doing... Um, building cohorts in oncology, but able to expand quickly into neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular, et cetera. Also give us diversity in stage, and really importantly, in patient population. And that's one of the real benefits of working with Sutter and their network of hospitals in Northern California is that we will get um, um, quite a bit of diversity in just in patient population. Uh, it's also critical that we work with healthcare provider um, partners that have very strong patient right protection, uh, via data governance and consent, and that our experience in conducting these types of observational, longitudinal, real-world studies, uh, data, uh, sorry, um, uh, studies that harness real-world data. Um, and um, I'm going to go a little bit through the data extraction process, but it's really key that we work with healthcare systems that are aware of the issues um, with electronic healthcare data and pulling data out of the EHR and understand the quality of certain fields and where we're going to need to intervene and do manual extraction. And so through this um, network of partners, this is going to give us a continuous source of very rich, very clean longitudinal data, again, with that right to recontact for additional studies. And so initially, we are focusing in two disease areas, um, colorectal cancer, and I'm going to walk through the details both on the clinical data side and the um, genomic data side on that one, um, and um, a second cohort on multiple sclerosis, which I'll give some detail on and then um, turn over to, to Greg to talk about a little bit more. Okay, so the colorectal cancer clinical genomic uh, solution. Um, the... In, um, 
uh, the original, so the um, intention here is to start with about 400 patients. And the way that this is going to work is that the healthcare system that we're partnering with will be responsible for clinical operations, um, consent, biobanking of samples, et cetera. DNA Nexus picks it up from the point of um, processing the sequencing data, integrates everything, and then it will be um, accessible through the DNA Nexus platform. So when we started looking at how we wanted to design this cohort, and we work really closely with the clinician researchers at the healthcare institution, um, obviously a critical link to getting the protocol designed correctly to make sure we get the cohort that we want. We also wanted to um, you know, take a look at the data sets that are already out there and, um, so, and then describe how the DNA Nexus colorectal cancer uh, cohort is going to differ with respect to the data sets that are out there. So what we have here is a decidedly non-quantitative uh, bubble plot. Um, where we just wanted to take a look at some of the um, colorectal cancer data sets that are available out there and give you a comparison of what we're intending with DNA Nexus. And so the intention here is to, along the clinical detail axis and the genomic detail axis, just give some perspective on data sets that already exist out there. Some of you might be familiar with the combined Flatiron um, Foundation Medicine linked clinical genomic data set database. Um, which currently has probably closer to 3,000 um, patients right now. Um, and this is a data set that I would consider fairly high on the clinical detail level, although we're hearing some issues around completeness. Um, nonetheless, there's quite a bit of clinical detail on these. However, it is completely fixed on the genetic detail level, as this is all um, NGS panel data, um, and so relatively low on the genomic detail scale. Um, by contrast, TCGA data, which I'm sure many of you have used and leveraged yourselves, very high on the genomic detail with multiple assays on each individual's. But the clinical data um, is limited and is actually um, missing in a lot of cases um, as people go in to start to investigate this data. And so our intention with the DNA Nexus colorectal cancer cohort, again, is to start with about 400 patients and scale up um, into the thousands as um, we scale this process up, and to be very high on clinical, da clinical data scale, clinical detail, and also very high on the genomic detail. And so now I'll just walk you through each of the components of how we're going to um, um, pull all this data together. Okay. So right now, um, this is a kind of a high-level timeline of the tissue acquisition and biobanking um, component of the cohort. Again, this activity will happen at the healthcare partner institution, um, where with initial diagnosis, there will be a blood sample collected for germline exome sequencing, stool sample collected for microbiome shotgun sequencing, and a urine sample that will be biobanked um, for potential future assays. And um, then the idea is to follow these patients uh, over time, and again, the intention is to follow these patients for a minimum of three years. Um, the tumor sample will be collected at um, surgery, and that, will, that sample will be utilized for uh, tumor exome sequencing and also for RNA-seq. Um, there are, um, sorry, don't mean to get that up there. Um, there are other um, time points throughout the natural course of the patient's um, disease progression where additional samples will be acquired and biobanked. Those are the ones in gray. Um, and those will just be biobanked for future assays if desired by um, whoever is um, licensing access to um, this cohort. So, for example, if there's a desire to do additional assays around metabolomics or proteomics um, or circulating tumor DNA, um, that is all um, um, considered in the consent and will be possible um, down the road. But the, the assays in green are the ones that will be um, included in this initial cohort. So, again, whole exome sequencing on blood, uh, microbiome shotgun sequencing on a stool sample, and whole exome sequencing on tumor and RNA-seq on tumor as well. Okay, so then um, a, uh, most of that tissue is biobanked, and aliquot goes to a sequence service provider who runs those assays. Those FASTQ files then come to DNA Nexus, where our science team um, uh, 
runs uh, DNA Nexus bioinformatics pipelines, um, and the outputs of those analyses will include uh, SNVs for normal and tumor, structural or copy number variants for normal and tumor, a tumor normal pipeline to ensure that we're identifying tumor specific findings, RNA seq for transcript expression quantification, gene fusion, fusion detection and microbiome species estimation. And importantly, the um, design of these pipelines and the uh, types of outputs and variants that we are um, going to call and um, uh, have available on this cohort, again, it, we're working very in very tight conjunction with the questions that the uh, clinician researchers have at the um, healthcare partner institution and also pharma customers that are considering um, licensing access to this cohort. So it's a very iterative process that we're going through before we actually kick off this study to, again, keep that customer focus and ensuring that the data that we're collecting is going to meet the um, um, questions that they, the way that they want to interrogate the data. Okay, so now moving on to the clinical data side, um, and again, a very high-level timeline of how this is going to work. Um, again, on initial diagnosis and um, consent and enrollment in the study, um, that really kicks off the beginning of the journey of collecting all of this longitudinal clinical data. And so we'll start with a very detailed patient history. We'll also have the opportunity to um, administer questionnaires to fill in any holes that we know are going to be there in the electronic health record. Um, we you know, talked about um, in the last panel, um, diet, um, any other environmental exposures that we think are critical for understanding on this population, um, we can always introduce those in the questionnaire. Um, that will be um, curated through um, an electronic case report form. And then kind of every um, major, well, every um, significant clinical event in the patient history, in the natural history of the, the patient's um, disease progression, will kick off another round of curation of data. So for example, post-surgery, the pathology report um, can be accessed, and then there's an electronic case report form to pull the essential um, data elements out of that. Upon completion of uh, chemotherapy or another treatment regimen, that kicks off another round of curation using a different electronic case report form. Um, and then upon metastasis, if that should occur, another pathology report. So I think you get the idea. Again, um, we're following these patients over quite a bit of time. Um, and this will all be done using the healthcare provider electronic data capture system. Um, so just to give you, um, this is by no means a complete list of all of the fields and values that we'll be collecting, but general categories, so certainly demographic information, medical history, comorbidities, prior malignancies, diet, tumor information, um, using um, um, obviously um, structured fields for colon cancer, the critical component of identifying whether it was left-sided or right-sided, um, routine markers that are already um, done and available through the electronic health record will also be pulled out. Many of these markers will also be um, uh, things that we can determine from the sequencing, um, but we're going to pull them out of the electronic health record as well. Therapy regimens, including reason for ending treatment, adverse events, outcome information, etc. cetera. Um, and I've marked a few fields, um, therapy regimen, adverse event, outcome information, where manual curation and interpretation of multiple unstructured fields will be required in order to enter this derived data. Um, and that's where, again, partnering with healthcare systems um, that uh, have robust systems for curating this data and where we will be able to participate in the implementation of that system is really important. And so just at a very high level, I, there's an awful lot of detail that is missing here, but just to give you an idea of how this uh, will work, and it will be slightly different depending on the electronic data capture and software system at the healthcare institution. But generally speaking, um, these systems have the ability to um, pull in a complete electronic health record data on each of the patients in this cohort into a software database that then resides within this electronic data capture system. That then kicks off study-specific curation, and there is data that will be curated um, and added to these patients that will be specific to this study, does not go back to the electronic health record. 
Um, and all of that takes place inside this electronic data capture system. So, for example, um, areas that um, we are notoriously incomplete, and so when we're capturing treatment regimen data, stop dates are often missing. Um, um, there's often uh, repeat uh, um, values because it was ordered using one name and um, it shows up in the progress notes as another name. So getting very complete and accurate on treatment, re treatment regimen data um, will work where certain fields from the electronic health record can be pushed into these electronic case report forms. And then, um, I don't know if I have a pointer, but the uh, uh, person with the stethoscope hanging around their neck, uh, that's a, someone that's actually working within the clinic who is doing this data curation, will be able to then um, fill out the remaining fields in that case report form by leveraging structured and unstructured data um, and make it either an interpretation or determination. And um, the way that this will work is that we'll have at least two curators um, uh, curating the same from the same patient. Um, and then uh, in cases where there is um, a lack of agreement, we can have that adjudicated by a third person interpreting. So the way these, this particular electronic data capture system is set up, there are constraints built into the values. There are controlled vocabularies that we can utilize and um, around making sure we're using, for example, Rx norm to structure um, and be consistent about drug names, um, uh, CTA, CAE fields for um, adverse events. We have a lot of control over introducing semantic consistency and structure at the point of curation. Um, and there's also the ability for QC checks, um, looking for missing fields, et cetera. And after quite a bit of process, um, then an electronic case report form would then be approved and reside in the study-specific um, database. That database will also include the consent form and any data coming from questionnaires um, that the um, will be administered in the clinic. And so um, DNA Nexus will be defining and managing and auditing this process um, in working in tight conjunction with the healthcare system um, that will be running the cohort. That integrated database um, will then be exported to the DNA Nexus platform. Um, at that point, it is integrated with the genomic data and we will have a um, linked clinical genomic uh, cohort Again, for colorectal cancer, it will be initially on 400 patients, and we'll be growing that over time. Um, and that uh, data is ingested and harmonized, and I, tomorrow, um, Fan and Brett and Geet are going to talk about some extraordinarily cool enhancements to the platform that are going to um, enable exploration of these cohorts, um, the ability to kick off analyses. Um, our job with these cohorts is to put that investment up front in the quality of the data, the completeness of the data, the structure of the data, as interoperable as possible, so that when it is, uh, does get ingested onto the DNA Nexus platform, um, it will be as close as ready um, for analysis. And all of this comes together, um, hopefully to, again, come back to our customer goals of utilizing real-world clinical and phenotype data combined with genomic data um, to um, uh, in the case of the colorectal cancer cohort, hopefully identify multimodal features and biomarkers that correlate with patterns of drug response uh, and real-world endpoints, whether that's utilizing and calculating something like a time to next treatment as a proxy for disease progression. Um, because of the microbiome component in this cohort, um, there's an opportunity to identify bacterial communities associated with disease subtypes. Uh, and then hopefully understand the impact of microbiome on treatment success and ultimately improve the screening and uh, diagnosis and treatment pathways for colorectal cancer. Importantly, these are goals that are shared by both pharma and healthcare institutions uh, in R&D uh, workflows and also to forward precision medicine goals. And we found that that is really the key in building this network of uh, healthcare providers who will partner with us to help source these cohorts is that um, there's very strong motivation um, to um, get uh, additional research on their own patients um, uh, by adding in this uh, genomic data layer. 
Okay, so that's the colorectal cancer cohort. I realize I'm going through a tremendous amount of information with not probably as much detail as you all would like, but I'm here uh, um, the rest of the day and tomorrow for lots of questions if people have them. Um, the second cohort um, that we are uh, close to operational on is a multiple sclerosis clinicogenomic um, cohort. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of this one, very similarly structured with respect to um, the healthcare institution that we partner with, Sutter, will be responsible for running the clinical operation side of things, consenting patients. Um, we're working iteratively on the protocol. We're uh, waiting with bated breath to hear from the IRB about um, when the study will be approved. Um, and then they're responsible for uh, clinical data c collection, biobanking blood sample. Um, again, that then goes off to sequence service provider. The FASTQ files then come to DNA Nexus. We run our pipelines and integrate all the data on the platform. And so one additional component to this cohort um, is that imaging data is really critical here. Um, so this cohort will include um, a blood sample for whole exome sequencing, uh, clinical data extraction, very similar to um, what I outlined for the colorectal cancer, but obviously different fields that are specific to MS. Um, but again, through study questionnaires, automated uh, data pulled from electronic health record, supplemented with manual curation, and then the addition of imaging data. Um, and again, um, the high-level categories of data that we'll be collecting, um, including a lot of detail on disease subtyping and treatment outcome measures, because really the goal with the um, MS cohort, and again, these are goals that are shared by uh, pharma R&D who are interested in this cohort, and the Precision Medicine Initiative and the clinician researchers at Sutter is to combine the imaging, clinical, and phenotype data to enable correlation of phenotypes and genotypes with the findings that are coming from the imaging data um, and hopefully identify the genetic, um, additional genetic underpinnings of disease subtypes and, oh, I just saw that, thank you, and disease progression and understand patient response um, to disease modifying therapies, um, which we'll have a lot of data on, again, because we're being very intentional about curating um, treatment outcome uh, longitudinally for these patients and also understanding what the genomic contributions might be to those differential response to disease-modifying therapies. Um, okay, so that was a bit of a whirlwind. I'm hoping it gave you a pretty good feel for what um, the new program that we're launching here at DNA Nexus. We see it as very complementary to the um, large-scale population-level um, data sets that are out there and are filling a um, really strong unmet need around disease-specific cohorts, tracking patients longitudinally with a very strong focus on treatment outcomes and patient outcomes and disease progression. Um, so I'll end with that and happy to take any questions.